hidden story, an experience that's sheltered from public view. The culmination of what we've spent the best part of a year working on suddenly appears, fully formed, fully resolved. What has transpired in that time between creation and launching is a mystery. How you think and feel and do at any given moment, opening up the process and saying, here it is, this is why and how this object has come into being, is a vulnerable position to place not just the company, but you yourself, because you're allowing people in to see your mistakes or your inabilities or your shortcomings. The creative process can be frenetic at the best of times, often a fleeting and delicate process, especially when operating a small business like ours. Exploring an idea from genesis to completion can be quickly scuppered by other things needing attention, a meeting or a time sensitive task or, in the case of the Morars design process, launching another watch in the middle. Having the wedge of the GMT launch in the middle of this process has been a good thing actually, having that distraction. When I returned to the work that was laid down before the GMT launched, it could be reappraised with fresh eyes and it was quite revealing. I had intended to present some form of live streamed episode showing the design process as I went along and I thought it would be quite cool to have you all watch that in real time, but the Morar 310 design phase moved quite fast. I hit upon an avenue that demanded to be explored quickly, and given the rarity and fragility of these moments, it's just best to lean into it and go. Facing a blank sheet of paper can be incredibly daunting. An infinite chasm of possibility awaits, and whatever we can dream up, we can probably make. That's the most exciting part of what I do, is seeing what will become of the process. For the Morar 310, we already have the original project to call upon as a foundation, and so the approach in my mind was actually two things. Bringing what worked from the original Morar forward into this iteration, but also trying to create something that felt like it was a piece of legitimate nautical hardware, an instrument designed for the ocean. The research phase was vital, speaking with Chris Lemons about his time spent as a saturation diver, instructed the design quite a lot from a technical perspective, and my time spent with retired search and rescue pilot Rod Steele, likewise, the Morar 310 really needs to bridge these two worlds, rather than focusing solely on diving. My own experiences sailing off the west coast of Scotland have been important as well, just existing and soaking up all the things around in that environment, so winches and sheets and grab rails, cleats, shackles, blocks, clutches, and many other things that are so important on a sailing yacht, scrutinising their designs and why they're made that way, everything is properly robust, often finished in bright chrome and built to last a lifetime of nautical abuse. In short, I really wanted to create an object that belonged at sea. So now, after nine months, multiple concept designs and over 150 iterative steps, I am delighted to reveal the final design for the Morar 310 dive watch. To explain more about the Morar 310 design process, I'll take you into the software that I use to design our watches. It's called Fusion 360. It's an Autodesk product that is a lot more cost effective than other things like SolidWorks or industry specific programs. It also has a number of really useful features built directly in. Fusion allows me to quickly build concepts in three dimensional space, accurately and physically correct. As I've said many times before, the movement is the place where everything starts for our designs and so 
I already have modelled a number of calibres inside the software, like the Myota 9039, that I can use as the initial building block for any design. After this, I start with the case design, and a few hours of rough blocking out usually gives me an idea of if a concept should be pursued or not. I quite like working this way over, say, sketching endlessly because I can see quite quickly if it's going to be disproportionate or too bulky or present manufacturing challenges or whatnot. I do some sketching to get initial shapes or ideas down for future referencing, but the bulk of my design time is spent in here. Fusion is a great platform to use because it allows me to generate the precise technical drawings from any final design that I create dimensioned and annotated drawings that can be included in the technical proposal that we send to manufacturers. It also allows me to export the 3D file that I can send to have 3D printed. This allows me to check sizing, ergonomics and even send the model alongside the technical proposal. The final thing I'll mention about Fusion is the magnificent physics-based rendering engine built directly into the program. In a few clicks, I can apply physics-based materials, textures, finishes, and then apply physics-based lighting to the object. This is great because it renders refractions and reflections accurately. I can see immediately if the crystal refraction is going to obscure important details, or I can see how different materials play against each other in various environments, so a photography studio, or outside in a park, or even at night. Emissive materials, like superluminova, can be applied and observed for interaction with the rest of the watch. It's a pretty amazing tool to have in the design kit, especially at a point where we're choosing our final colourways and variations. The case for the Morar 310 comprises of a main chassis that accepts all the different parts, so the bezel, crystal, dial, iron cage, case back, crown and crown guards. The case profile is a simple cylinder with a round over bottom edge and sides that are completely vertical, diameter 41.5mm. The case walls are relatively thick so that we can easily achieve 310 meters of water resistance. You can see how much space is needed for the bezel and the spring clip that make the bezel unidirectional. The vertical case sides lead into a slightly larger diameter bezel, 42mm. The bezel features a rifled grip, like all of our watches that have interactive elements. We try to introduce some skew to that texture. I think it looks a bit more dynamic and interesting than a straight fluting for the Morar 310, the rifling runs the opposite direction to the original. This mirroring of the angle of the rifling affords a far higher grip than the other direction, something that we learned on the Scepter project and through the advent of affordable 3D printing, which we didn't have access to in 2016. The grip itself is not uniformly straight scalloped down the side, it's tapered with the fat end of that taper to the top of the bezel where your thumb and fingers naturally grip, thinning as it goes down to the bottom of the bezel. This gives us the biggest grip contact at the top edge of the bezel, whilst affording us the space, tolerance and room at the base of the bezel for the underside, where we see the 120 notches that accept the spring clip and give us the unidirectional function. The bezel insert is solid ceramic for most of the skews. Ceramic is an incredibly robust material. It can be moulded with whatever design you fancy and resists scratches and point impacts incredibly well. We thought about using aluminium, but the galvanised or painted surfaces tend to wear away over time, where ceramic just doesn't. It's not a wonder material, and it does suffer one pretty large Achilles heel. If you apply any sort of shear or bend to the ceramic, it cracks like a breadstick. 
Point blows are compression, however, and it's pretty unbeatable. The bezel insert has a gentle arc to the top surface, which, when viewed in profile, creates the water shedding surface that I really wanted to have. The markings of the bezel insert form an interesting focus point. A dive watch traditionally has a bezel that counts upwards from 0 to 60 with the first 15 minutes of that scale chopped into minute segments. It's a legacy of historical diving that has little to no use in today's diving. Risk computers are the tool of preference. So does this make the traditional style of bezel useless in a modern use setting? Well, not exactly, because you can still use the bezel to show elapsed time by setting the pip to the minute hand. And in doing this, you can observe how much time has passed since you set it. Handy for some things maybe, but I guess the, the most people will set the pip somewhere in the future on the dial and then use that as a reference point as a countdown timer, totally ignoring the scale altogether. We do want to keep some models with this more traditional style of bezel, but it's an opportunity to do something a bit more useful, I think. Instead of having the seconds counting up, why not have the seconds counting down? This would allow you to set any amount of minutes, 60 all the way down to 1, and count down to the pip. Much more useful, especially when the Mora 310 is aligned with search and rescue, where timing is crucial. Having the mechanical ability to count down from 20 or 30 minutes certainly feels more practical and useful. There's three segments on this countdown bezel to try and bridge the two worlds. The first 15 minutes are segregated from the next 30 and the final 15 minutes are graded more clearly. This way you can use the bezel for both traditional use cases and for the more daily use cases too. Final note on the bezel construction, the pip forms an alignment pin for the bezel insert which has a hole at the 12 o'clock position. Whether or not we can achieve this in production is yet to be discovered, but it looks really smart poking through the insert and standing proud above the ceramic surface. This is one of the weak points for any dive watch, after the crown. The larger the diameter of the crystal, the thicker it needs to be to withstand the pressure at depth. The diameter of the Morar crystal is just over 29mm, so we've put a big whacking thick bit of sapphire in here. The profile is a semi-single domed cross section, so the bottom is completely flat and the top has a rounded edge leading into another completely flat surface. This gives it a bit of a retro look whilst keeping the mechanical and visual properties we want. When a watch goes under water, interesting refractions happen, magnifying the dial in strange ways, so having a fully domed crystal tends to distort the dial too much. It creates a sort of hotspot tunnel vision for the dial where you can only see it at certain angles. So by having the two flat surfaces, the idea is that legibility, even underwater, will remain relatively unaffected. Having such a thick bit of glass also gives us another benefit, which we can see through the physics-based rendering element of Fusion 360. The dial, when not in water, is almost projected up onto the outside surface of the crystal and brings the dial closer to the viewer. You can see it clearly when I click through these two images. Having the physics engine behind the renderer, we can set whatever refraction index properties we need, so for sapphire crystal, is around 1.7, and we can input that here to adjust how much refraction a glass material has. Working our way around to the back, the case back is solid and features a design that we've yet to fully settle on, but for the purposes of the technical proposal, this is fine for now. It may stay this way, it may change. Underneath the case back is something entirely new for us and something we've tried to do in the original Morar, although not quite as robustly as this. This is an iron cage. The iron cage is here to prevent magnetization, one of the biggest issues we hear from our customers. Mechanical watches have an inherent risk when it comes to magnets and even a quick brush against a magnet can wreak havoc with your movement. And to prevent this, we can encase the entire movement inside a magnetically repellent material, soft iron. 
By doing this, we are protecting the movement against any magnetic source, whether it be something on a dive boat, or a laptop hard drive, or any number of magnetic sources in modern life. Some movement manufacturers have mitigated the effects of magnetization by using non-metal hairsprings, but unfortunately we don't have access to that sort of technology yet. Inside the iron cage is the Myota 9039 Japanese automatic movement. There's a number of reasons that we've decided to use this movement again, the biggest of which is how thin it is. Thinner than a lot of the calibers available to us on the market, and has all the specs that we could ever need of a movement. So it has a high beat rate, it has a long power reserve, high accuracy, and incredible reliability. Having a thin movement also gives us a lot more control over the design of the watch. So it gives us more flexibility in terms of the case thickness, the wall thickness, the crystal thickness. The thicker the movement, the harder it is to control these envelope dimensions as you're designing around that bulk rather than designing for ergonomics or aesthetics. I mean, the Atlantic's a great example. That watch was beholden to the Seiko movement thickness, and that watch is as thin as we could make it. The original Morar featured integrated crown guards, and most dive watches feature crown guards that are machined as part of the case. Given that this is the place where door wax or damage can occur when a watch is on wrist, Having a sacrificial, perishable, replaceable set of crown guards seemed like a good thing to me, and having them etched with little details that show the direction of the screw down crown adds in a bit of interest to this area too, makes it feel more tool like. The crown is exactly the same design as the Morar first edition, a nice little nod to the original. The crown is screwed down and features both double o-rings on the stem but also internal seals in the crown itself that seat against the case when it's screwed down, creating an additional chamber of redundancy. All fairly standard stuff but crucial to maintaining the 310 metre water resistance. Early on in the design process, I made the decision to not be duty bound to a fitted end link bracelet. Despite the popularity of metal straps that have end links that fit around the curvature of the case and create an unbroken track of metal around the wrist, in order to make that strap style effective, you must follow certain rules with the design of the lugs. Now I want all of our designs to be as unique as they are approachable. And I certainly don't set out to alienate folk, but as designers, we must follow our hearts and create what we feel fits the overall approach and aesthetic of any given watch. That's what makes Marlowe unique. I've tried multiple lug designs for the Morar, including a more traditional style of lug that could accept a fitted end link metal bracelet. But each time I would look back on the tubular style and immediately feel drawn to it. I love the way that these lugs look alongside all the other case elements and it really does result in a watch that presents like a piece of nautical engineering, a manifold or a grab rail on a sailboat, an instrument designed for the sea. Metal bracelets will of course fit these lugs but with flat ends, so apologies to anyone who feels aggrieved by this decision. If I rotate the Morar around, you'll see, tucked inside those lugs at 12 o'clock, is a dot, a wee circle of interest. This is a helium release valve, probably the most underutilised element on any dive watch ever. For the HRV10 gauge, you need to be immersed in a helium rich atmosphere at a simulated depth that results in pressure building up enough inside your watch that the one-way valve actuates to release these potentially damaging helium bubbles. In other words, a professional saturation diver. Assuming that the bulk of people buying and wearing dive watches are not professional saturation divers, this little valve and its reason for existing mean very little to anyone, and I guess you could ask why we are installing one on the Mora 310 especially given our quite strict rule of a no unnecessary faff. The reason that we've put 
a HRV on the Mora 310 is because it's doing a similar job as the water resistance rating. It's a symbol of robustness, of intent, of seriousness, of utility and ability and competency even. This watch can do anything you could ever wish for underwater and thus by extension of that logic is extremely capable for where it will be mostly used on land. It's also another way for us to gather vital experience. By including such things on new watches, it educates us. Overall then, the more our case design is a robust, nautical and purposeful design, iteratively building upon the original Morar unibody style case, but bringing the design more in line with both market expectations for a dive watch and the improvements in knowledge and design abilities that we've gathered over the past eight years. The dial is arguably the most crucial element to get right for a watch because it's where the information that you require, having chosen to wear a watch in the first place, is displayed. Spending so long crafting the externals only to fluff the dial through overcomplication or cluttered confusion or oversimplification would be a disaster. It all has to balance out with the other elements, all resonate together to form one cohesive statement. The dials for the Mora 310 follow two directions, traditional with a more classic dive watch aesthetic and modern with a more progressive design. Both versions feature applied indices filled with loom fixed to a textured dial surface. A raised and profiled chapter ring surrounds the dial and adds the granular minute track. For the traditional dial, I've used a couple of subtle nods to the original Morar by using the shell shapes for the main cardinal points. The hands are more traditional in shape too, with a profiled sword for the hour and minute hands, windows of loom in both, and a hairline running second hand with counterweight. For the modern dial, I've taken a few little inspirations from the search and rescue side. The windows on the side of rescue helicopters form the hour blocks, again filled with loom and different sizes depending on their location on the dial. The hands nod to a few things, the squared off brutal hand shape of the original Morar, but also the underside of some SAR helicopters feature bright orange chevrons, which I've brought into the window section of the hour and minute hands. Both of these hands are profiled so that they catch the light at all angles and lighting environments. Crucially, they now have an arrow tip for maximum accuracy. Finally, the running seconds hand is loosely based on the outline of a rotor blade. For both dials, the luminous treatment follows the original with a two-tone scheme. The pip, 12 o'clock index and the minute hand are filled with green loom and the other hour blocks, hour hand and seconds counterweight are filled with blue loom. It's a separation of duty, so the bezel and minute hand being the main differentiator, but having the 12 o'clock block being green simply gives us orientation in the dark, so it's a kind of simple yet effective solution. Once the design was fully resolved and I was happy with it, the way it all looked and fitted together, I set about building what we call our technical proposal. So this is a document, usually digital, where all the information required for someone coming unsighted to the Mora project could read this document and understand everything there is to know about the design, the colours, the references, the textures, sizes, materials, and the reasons for me designing things a certain way. A pretty big document, heavy reading, but essential for when we hand over the design so that the questions that come back to us are very few. Ambiguity is the biggest enemy of progress. The last thing I want to show is the variants and the thought process that I've taken to create them. For the main skews, I've split the variants into three categories each with two colourways. So we've got a land, an air and a sea. These colourways won't all get manufactured in this first phase, but I'll come to how we intend to choose them in a bit. This is the most traditional set of Morar watches. Monochrome, simple and the most aligned with market expectations for what a dive watch should look like. The bezel insert has the traditional dive style markings with contrasting paint fill and a traditional dial design with nods to the original Morar. The first skew is jet black with white accents, classic, traditional. The second is a white dial with black and orange accents 
and a stainless steel bezel insert, again classic and a bit more traditional. For project and manufacturing referencing, we're calling these two the black and the white. These naming conventions will either continue through to launch or we'll have to find a better name for each of them to avoid any potential issues. Taking inspiration from Rod Steele and the search and rescue side, the two air models are inspired by the liveries of the icons of search and rescue helicopters, the Westland Wessex in a Royal Navy colourway and the Westland Sea King in the Royal Air Force colourway. Both feature the same bezel design with triple section markings. The one on the left we're calling the Steel, in a nod of respect and admiration to Rod and all that he's achieved. A Royal Navy colourway with dark grey, blue, red and white. The one on the right we're calling the Gold King, featuring the official British standard paint colour of golden yellow with red, black and white accents. No prizes for guessing why. The final set of launch skews are the sea inspired set, so warships and lifeboats. This set features a third bezel insert design that's slightly simpler than the air bezel but still offers a countdown scale. The one on the left is called the Destroyer, which is a pretty good name for a watch. This has a mid to dark grey base and a sky blue combo that looks really beautiful, aggressive and tactical. And the one on the right is tentatively called the Severn and features bright orange, a rich deep blue and mid grey colouring. For this project we're also going to do something that we haven't done before and that's arrange for several kits to be made at the same time as the main production. The goal has always been for us to bring assembly in-house, so what better way to speed that along than have a bunch of things ready to be assembled. So we've got a few interesting colourways in the kits and I'll keep those secret for now, but something really cool happened when I was finalising the kit colourways and I was lucky enough to be recording my screen at the time. It happened when I was scrolling around whilst compiling the technical proposal and for some reason the colours on the screen glitched as I was passing over the destroyer colourway. Suddenly there was this sort of tropical dark greeny blue colourway instead of the mid grey and sky blue. And I loved it so much that I decided to sample it and see what it looked like on the Morarn 3D. And it looks so good that I've made it into one of the kits. A stroke of luck and happenstance, but like I say, sometimes these things are fleeting and rare and you just have to try and seize it. It's almost inevitable that in the time between submitting the design to manufacturing for quotation and the green light to start making it, there will be things that I want to tweak or change slightly or things that the manufacturers find tricky to make or too costly. So once the project is fully signed off, the manufacturers set to work tooling up, getting their supply chain educated with our designs and our requirements and the hundreds of details that need to be captured. It's a mammoth task and is probably why it takes around 9 to 12 months for the production to finalise. A lot of that time is spent in handing over all information and making sure that everybody understands what's required of them. In the meantime, we can get some 3D prints made up to confirm everything is how we want it. I've had a few of these made up already, both at the start of the design phase and then once everything was kind of finalised. It's a good way to check physical dimensions and wearability in a very kind of crude way, but it gives us a great indication of wrist proportions, comfort levels, crown dig and the tactility of the bezel and crown. These details are resolved enough in a 3D print to be effective in aiding decisions to be made. You can see here that the initial Mora design was a wee bit bigger than what we've sent to production. One of the final parts in the production puzzle for us are the samples that we receive from the manufacturer. These are production quality parts made from the final materials and or fully working samples that allow us to check and make sure that everything is perfect before mass production starts. It's the last point of input but arguably the most important. If we miss something at this stage, it'll be baked into every single watch that's made. There are ways to amend things midway through production, but it's very, very costly, so where possible, we try to avoid it. Samples usually arrive around 10 weeks after handover, but with COVID still causing supply chain issues, 
as well as the myriad worldly problems that we're seeing, it will be a wee bit longer this time. But we wait with anticipation and excitement to see the Morar in the physical world for the first time. So there we have it. That's nine months now since the decision was made to design the next Morar dive watch, and what a crazy nine months it's been. Hopefully this episode has shown a little of what is demanded of us for every single one of our projects and why sometimes we maybe fall off the radar. The work required to create these designs and then transfer that into detailed information for manufacturing takes a lot of time and energy but it's worth it when the path to production is smoother as a result. I really hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit behind the curtain. The Morar 310 is looking pretty good I think. It's so exciting to create a new watch anyway, but it's even more so when it's a watch this capable. I can't wait to see the samples, and I'm even more excited to get these watches made and out into the world. So following immediately after this episode, I'll be broadcasting live from here, the Marlow studio, ready to chat to you all about the Morar 310 and answer any burning questions you might have. We'll also be putting out a poll on the Facebook fan page for you guys to choose what colourways we make for production. All the links for the live stream and the Facebook fan page will be in the description box below. Thanks to everyone for watching, take care of yourself and others, and I'll see you shortly. You might be wondering why there's a cut on my forehead here. Well, as I was setting up this light above me, um, I walked into the end of the C-stand and put a big cut on my forehead just before I started filming, so... <laughs>